<laughs> you get to be 62, you got to breathe every now and then. <laughs> okay, can we hear me okay? Okay. All right, so I'm going to yep. just... Yep, go I'm, ahead. I'm just going to zip through reading the chapter here because I want you to hear it. And I'm going to try to put a little feeling and emotion in it as I go through here. Hopefully that will be helpful and not distracting. Okay, so let's read quickly to there's, uh, what did we say, 31 verses, 31? Uh, 33, 33 verses, 33 verses in chapter 9. Okay, so let's, let's just sit through this. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish that myself, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken non effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will Harden it. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to shew his wrath and to make his power known, endureth much, long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory? Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Osi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, Ye are not my people. There shall they be called the children of the living God. 
Isaiah is also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it, not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Amen. So there is, there is the chapter itself, and I hope that gives us a little sense of how it sounds. Um, reading it is one thing, hearing it read out loud is, is another thing, I think, altogether. And I hope that's, that's somewhat helpful. Let's take a quick look at page 93, the very next page in our book. And we see the quotes in the order of their appearance. Romans chapter 9, verse 7, is in the book of Genesis. So we know who the author of Genesis is, yes? Yep. Not Junie, but who can tell me who the author of Genesis is? Moses. Moses, yes. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And I believe some of the Psalms are also accredited to Moses. So now really? I didn't know that. I thought it was David and... Um... There's a few people. Yeah, more than one. Okay. Yeah, I think a few of the Psalms are attributed to Moses. Uh, the horse and the rider were thrown into the sea, especially. I don't know. I have to look that one up. Uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 7. So it says, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. So it's talking about that reference that we just read with regard to the children and how all of Israel is not Israel, the selected or the elect were in that, that particular seed, the seed of Isaac. Uh, verse 9 of chapter 9, another quote, At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. Genesis 18.10. And this really is very much the sovereignty of God because Sarah could not have a child on her own. Do you think that Abraham and Sarah tried to have children down through the years? Of course they did. Sarah, Sarah was, um, she's like a midwife. She's helping other women to have their babies without being able to have a baby herself. So she has a, a, a terrible situation. For a woman in those days not to have a baby, that, that, that to her was like a very... Um, Shame. It was a shame. shame. Shameful thing. She felt shame. She felt um, dejected, like she wasn't a woman. Now, if a woman wants to have a baby today and can't have one, I'm sure that's frustrating too. But society isn't looking at you and saying, you, you didn't have a baby, what's wrong with you? That might be a personal thing on your feeling. And some women could care less. Our cousin Beaver, Junie, she never wanted to have any children, never. Mm -hmm. And she never did. And she's my age or close to it. So she's not thinking about having any babies now. And she said she doesn't miss it, never wanted to have it, never felt that way. Hey, that's okay. That's fine. You, you be you. But at this time, not to have a baby meant a big deal. So for Sarah, not to have a son or a child was a devastating thing for her. And the fact that she did have a baby was the sovereignty of God, was the mercy and the grace of God. This is God's plan in action. We'll have more to say about his sovereignty shortly. So take a look at page 94. And we see we've got quite a few quotes here because we've got pages after pages after pages of all the quotes in the form of some beautiful charts. So that third quote, also found in the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 23, Paul quotes in Romans 9, 12. And it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. What's all that about the elder shall serve the younger? Do we know? Can someone, Jacob and Esau. Can someone tell me? Uh, Jacob and Esau. Right. The, the younger brother 
is going to be served by the, the older brother. The older brother is going to serve the younger. So he's going to exalt the younger brother over the older brother. And again, in that culture, that's sort of a, a, an embarrassing thing. If you're the oldest son, you're expected to take the lead, right? The inheritance of the bulk of it would go to you. Well, let's look at our next quote, which is found in the very next verse, 913. And this is taken not from Genesis, but from Malachi chapter 1, verse 3. Now we're quoting the prophet Malachi. So we got Moses, we got Malachi, two so far. And the quote is, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Wow, that's pretty heavy, right? Let me stop and ask a question to everybody on board. When you read that, what does that say to you? How does that make you feel hearing that? Does that disturb you? Does that throw you off just a little bit? <laughs> Everybody's muted, so you guys need to unmute. <laughs> no, it doesn't disturb me. At first when I read it, it was a little bit weird, but then I realized that he wasn't, he's saying that he hates him, but it's because he already knows that he's not going to believe in him and he's not going to have faith in him. And God doesn't like sin. Amen. Yeah. 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 What, do you, what are your thoughts, Joe? Well, I'm I'm walking along this big highway in Kylie, but it's a hard. Um, it's a lot of background noise. But I amen to the sister that just said that. Yeah. Uh, I would just I would just say, according to God's foreknowledge, right? He knows ahead of time. Of course. Right? Of course. God doesn't just hate people randomly. I mean, He uh -huh. loves everyone. So uh -huh. if if He quote unquote hates you, He's not hating you up front. He's hating. He only hates you because you decided to hate Him. And he knew that way up front. He knew that yeah. way up front. We're, we're going to get into this in a minute here. Randy, what are your thoughts? Uh, I agree with all the above. <laughs> That's easy. Ashley, I want to hear from you. I'm still getting settled in, Uncle Mike. I just got home. Sorry. Just give That's me okay. like five minutes. You're off the hook. And Brian, what are your thoughts? He, he, he hated the sin. Yes. He doesn't hate people. God, has, God loves you. He died for your sins. And everybody is invited in every dispensation, right? He's no respecter of person, so it's not personal. And many times we're going to see this usage of the word Esau. He's talking about more than one person. He's talking about the descendants of Esau who were godless, who despised the Lord, despised him. He hated the unbelief. He hated their unbelief. Yep, he hated their unbelief. Uh, okay, so let's move right along. And I think we just answered one of our questions at the end there. Uh, on page 95, uh, 915, and we see there's quote after quote after quote here. There are like one or two verses apart. For he saith to Moses, for remember introduces a purpose clause, there's a conjunction, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And that's Exodus, also written by Moses. The first five books of the Bible called the Torah, right? called, uh, is by, it's written by Moses, first five books of the Bible, the Torah, also called the Pentateuch. Penta means five, five books. Uh, Exodus, so that's Moses as well. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. God gets to make that decision. We don't get to second guess him. Isn't right? that another picture of God's sovereignty? Yeah, it is. He gets, he gets, he gets to pull the plug when he pulls the plug. You know, because we look and we say, well, and God is fair. He's not unfair. He's absolutely righteous and just. But some people, and maybe a very wicked person, lives to be 90 years old. And then you see some young person die and they're 30 years old. And we cry and our hearts are ripped apart. And we say, why did this person die at such a young age? We don't get to second guess God any more than Job did. You know, you can ask God a question, but you can't question God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We can ask questions, but we can't question what God has done. You can't question his intent no. or his purpose. No, you can't because he knows what he's doing. We don't know what we're doing. We think we're no, we think we know what we're doing. We don't. We, we don't. And if you think you know what you're doing and you find out at some point in your life, you really don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. that's, a very, that's a very humbling moment, is it not? Mm -hmm. Right, so we can ask God questions, and we see people in the Bible asking God questions, and God is 
seem to be happy to answer the questions, but you don't get to question God. You don't get to do that. You don't get to put him on the witness stand and test his character and that sort of thing. That's completely out of line. Uh, on page 95, at the bottom, we've got Romans 9.17, which is taken from Exodus also. This time it's Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. For scripture saith unto Pharaoh, now we're int introduced to the Pharaoh of Egypt, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. And God's explaining a little bit here why he was patient with this particular sinner, that I might chew my power in thee and that my name might be declared. And he goes on throughout all the earth, right? So he tells us why he was patient and long suffering with Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is used as the example. And people will say, well, look, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, yes, he did harden Pharaoh's heart. And he says he hardened Pharaoh's heart and he was very patient with him. But the real issue, I think, is how did he harden Pharaoh's heart? We've covered this many times before. He covered Pharaoh's heart by telling him the truth. Hardened his heart. Yeah, that hardened his heart. Hearing the truth hardened his heart. And hearing the truth from Moses, who was like a stepbrother or a half-brother or something, right? Moses was raised in Pharaoh's household. So obviously they knew each other and grew up together. And Moses could have ascended to the throne. It wasn't God's will for that to happen, right? But he certainly positioned there and learned everything there is to know about Egypt and their, their, their history, their science, their everything. Moses was very well trained. He was a musician. He was a military genius. He was a, a builder. He had many talents and skills like nothing we've seen in our lifetime, right? Or in modern history, I would say. Moses was really a phenomenal person. But, but God sends Moses to Pharaoh, and they know each other. So that's a very humbling thing for Pharaoh to be approached by your brother, who maybe you don't even like or get along with. <laughs> and and what, does, what does Moses do? Moses tells him the truth. Moses identifies the living God. And he says, let my people go. This is what God says. Let my people go that they may worship me. And Pharaoh says, I'm not gonna, it's not going to happen. And he played this game back and forth, back and forth, right, with all the plagues, which we, which we all know. That's how his heart was hardened. God sent Moses. Now, if, if God sends you a Moses to talk to you, and, and that person gives you incredible information, and God backs it up with signs and wonders and miracles like he did, not just signs and wonders and miracles, but judgment to get your attention, that's great patience. That's great kindness. That's great mercy. He did show mercy to Pharaoh. But when it says he hardened his heart, you got to ask, well, how did he harden his heart? He gave him the truth. And we see that same phenomena today. If you tell someone the truth, they may become very angry with you. <laughs> have, you have you ever witnessed to somebody and then they get mad at you because now they're accountable? Well, they were accountable before. But you telling them what you told them, and they acknowledge it, they understand it, but they don't want to hear it. They may be extremely upset with you for telling them that information. People don't like to hear the truth. Some people do. A lot of people don't want to hear the truth. Some people will even attack you if you tell them the truth. Right? Well, you see people getting very, very angry when you're, when you're uh, witnessing to them. Oh, yeah. The demons coming out of them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Romans chapter 9, verses 27 through 28 are a quote from Isaiah. So we have Moses, we have Malachi, we have Hosea, and now we have Isaiah, right? So, so far we've got four prophets that are mentioned. So let's keep track of the number of prophets because that's one of our questions at the end of the chapter. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel. So we've got a quotation from Isaiah that we have just two left. We have Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. 
Now, Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabaoth, the Lord of the Sabbath, had left us a seed, they would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. There's another answer to one of our questions. Who would they have been like if God had not left them a seed? What he's saying, if God hadn't been merciful to us, had mercy upon whom he would have mercy, and, and not destroyed us, we would have been the same as Sodom and Gomorrah. They would have been completely wiped out and gone right out of existence. And then the last quote is also Isaiah. So we got to see, who did he quote the most here? That's one of our questions. As it is written, below, uh, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So we know that's a metaphor. Yes, Randy's got a question. Yep. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, on the following page is the verse uh, you omitted, which is verse 33. On this one? Top of page 99. I think it's in the... Uh, is oh. the verse third is the last verse of uh, the Romans nine of the chapter, which we inadvertently omitted. It's, it's, uh, in, in, it's dropping the in bottom books? of it uh, of this uh, chapter. Romans twenty nine. Yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. You got Romans twenty nine and Romans nine. No, that, that, that was in oh. the end. Okay. Okay. Page okay. ninety eight. Okay. All right. Page. Thank you. Page 99 at the top is the last verse, verse 33. Oh, okay, I see. I see what you're saying. And that's what I just read here, uh, the quotation, as it is written below. Right, behold. Yeah. right. so that's going to also answer our question about the stumbling stone. We, yep. know who, we know who the stumbling stone is, do we not? Yeah. Right? Yes. Amen. Right. Jesus is the stumbling stone, right, the stumbling block. He's called a rock of offense. Why would he be a rock of offense? He's, a, he's, a, he's offensive. Why is he offensive to some? Because it's, good, because it's truth. He's truth. He's absolute truth. But in telling the truth, which he certainly is and does, how is that? why are people offended by this truth? As it relates to us as members of the body of Christ in this dispensation, it's very offensive because you can't earn or deserve your salvation. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Why is it offensive? Why is he a stumbling block? He's a stumbling block because we say to people, and rightly so, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. There's mm -hmm. no other way. Now, Oprah and a whole bunch of others say, oh, no, there's many truths. <laughs> Jesus is just one of the truths. And Jesus didn't say, he didn't say, I am a way to God the Father. He said, I am the yeah. way. He used the definite article, the. Yeah. I am the truth, the way, the light. And no man, no person can come to the Father except by me. So if you would be saved, you have to go through Jesus Christ. And he's a stumbling block to the Jew, right? Because they refuse to accept him as their Messiah, right? And if, and if, you refuse to, re Gee, what did Jesus say to them? He said, which one of the prophets didn't you stone? Didn't you kill? You kill all the prophets and surely they're going to kill the son of God if they wipe out all of God's messengers. And then we have that parable of the vineyard where he sends the, the workers, he sends different representatives because the workers aren't taking care of business with, and then he sends his own son. And they say, let's kill the son and we'll take the vineyard for ourselves, right? Kill the owner's son and then we'll keep, because he'll have nobody to leave it to. It'll come to us then, right? <laughs> so he's an offense, right? He's a stumbling block. You can't come the way you want to come. You have to come the way that God has prescribed. And the only way you can come is through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay. So Amen. Verses 1 through 3, Paul speaks of his deep sorrow regarding Israel and their failure to believe the gospel. He goes on to say that he might wish that he himself were cut off from Christ for their sake. Right? This is very heavy. Paul's pouring out his heart here. And the first thing I want us to notice is this chapter is really pivotal. Chapter 8 was pivotal as well, but this one's different because for the next three chapters, he's dealing with Israel. He's addressing Israel. He's speaking about the nation Israel. He's going to start answering some questions. 
now that the body of Christ exists, well, what about the nation of Israel? Is God dealing with the earthly program and the heavenly program together at the same time? Are these two things running coterminous for the next 2,000 years? There's a lot of Christians out there that think they're Israel. They think they are the nation Israel. They think they're the bride of Christ. They think a lot of things which just are not accurate, right? So what happened to Israel? Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are going to explain to us dispensationally what happened to Israel. This is incredibly important because if we, if we miss this, we may be confused and think that the promises that were made to Israel are now being applied to us, and they are not. Now, question, uh, and this is something Brian and I kind of go, we're going back and forth with. Who is the audience here? Now, I know he's, he's talking, he's talking to Israel, to, uh, he's, he's talking about the Jews and their decline. Is the audience the Gentiles or is he talking to Jews here? You, I, I believe he's addressing Jews specifically. And we're going to see that that's going to bear itself out because, and not only is he talking to Jews, he's talking about Jews who belong to the previous program. He's not addressing the body of Christ because in the body of Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. Right. No Jew or Gentile. Ethnically, yes. Ethnically, yes. It's like you say, well, I'm saved and I'm a member of the body of Christ. Does that mean that my skin is no longer brown? I'm no longer American? No, of course not. You're you're ethnically who are who you are. Were you born Jewish and now you found faith in Jesus Christ? Well, praise God. Now you're a member of the body of Christ. You are not part of Israel. And we have Jews today that call themselves Messianic Jews, Jews who believe in their Messiah. Well, you can call yourself anything you want to. You're a member of the body of Christ. You're a saved person. You're a member of the body of Christ. The, the audience, I just answered, the audience is Israel, but it's not Israel as members of the body of Christ. It's not saved Jews like you and I are saved. These are Jews. Jewish, He's dealing with the little flock. Those those Jews who believed that Jesus was their Messiah, who were saved. They, believe the, the, the old they believed under the old program, and they're part of the old program. They have not been grandfathered into the body of Christ. Right. These are Jews, and we're going to see this when we get to There's chapter. Church right now. Yes. This. Yeah. You. What happened is when Paul got saved, Israel just didn't disappear all of a sudden. No. You're talking about quite a few years where these two programs are running together at the same time. 40 40 years. Right, right. Over that 40-year period, you've got the fading away of the old program and the phasing in of the new program. And you can see Paul is dealing with more than one group of people. He's dealing with several groups here. He's dealing with unsaved Israel, who he's preaching to, and he's preaching the gospel of the grace of God to them so they can be saved and become members of the body of Christ. He confirmed the program that Peter preached, the gospel of the kingdom, though he's not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's certainly a minister, it said, of the New Testament. He knows the information perfectly well, and he's able to address questions, and and he did when he was in prison in Rome, in his house, and people came to visit him. At the end of Acts, it talks about him and these discussions concerning the kingdom of God. But Paul's not preaching the kingdom of God. He has a different gospel, which he... Three times in his writing, he calls it my gospel. My gospel. Very specific, the message that that Paul preached. But Paul spoke to the little flock, and that's who he's addressing here. Now, the little flock could fall away if, in fact, the Antichrist were to be ushered in in their time. They could fall away. We have the perfect example of that with Ananias and Sapphira. They fell away. They were included in the number, and they fell away. They did not endure until the end. So Paul's speaking to them. When we get to chapter 11, he's going to talk about being cut off. He's going to, be talk about, he's going to talk about being grafted in to the tree, and he's going to talk about being cut off. We're going to save that whole discussion for when we get to chapter 11. Uh, that's why we sent you that very nice PowerPoint that that guy did. He did a great job with that. Very impressive. And I want everybody to watch that at least once. Two or three times would be even better. You can send it to me. Oh, I'll send it to you. And I got it. Yeah, I've got it in my cell phone. I'll get that to you. Okay, so let's read on quickly here. 
Uh, verse 4, who are, number 1, this is verse 4, he's dealing with the Israelites. And he, number 1, he labels them as the Israelites. Number 2, he says, to whom pertaineth the adoption? So Israel has an adoption different than the adoption from the members of the body of Christ. We talked about our adoption last week. We talked in chapter 8 about the fact that our adoption, that we are, we are brought into the family of God as mature adults. Our status is as grown adults. So we're not called the little children of Israel. You see, hundreds of times God refers to the Jew as my little children, my beloved, even John, the apostle, right? In uh, Revel not Revelation, first, second, and third John, my beloved, my little children. He uses that expression over and over again. We see in Exodus, in uh, the first five books of the Bible, a little bit in Genesis at the end, and then more heavily, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. My little children, little children Israel's call. So their adoption differs from ours. Uh, Paul speaks of, uh, da, 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 of the adoption and then the glory, the doxa, the shekinah, he mentions in verse 3. And the covenants, all of that was given to Israel. And the giving of the law and the service of God, he's talking about in the temple, the temple service. And the promises... So all these things that he mentions here are things that we as members of the body of Christ did not have. We are said to be aliens. We, we were cut off. There were no promises. We had nothing. When, when the Tower of Babel happened and man, went his own, and man was dispersed, God basically walked away from, from the Gentiles, right? He called the calling of Abraham, the covenants, the blessings, the service, all these things that he mentions here belong to Israel, did not belong to the body of Christ. And it's interesting that he's mentioning it here because the audience to whom he's mentioning it knows exactly what he's talking about. If this is being written to Gentiles, they don't know what in the world you're talking about. They have no idea. When I first met my wife, my wife is Chinese, she would mention many things, and I had no idea what in the world she was talking about. <laughs> Why? Because I didn't understand Chinese culture. And then when I got over there to China, a lot of things that she was talking about begin to make sense to me. Why? Because I'm there. <laughs> and, and, and to function, I had to understand, to a certain degree, what's going on all around me. Right? So if... Many of the things that she mentioned to me or that I learned when I was there in China would take a while to explain to someone who's never been there, someone who's not aware of the culture. I couldn't just simply mention it in a letter to people that don't have the background. That would make no sense whatsoever. <clears throat> it would make no sense. So Paul's writing to an audience that knows what he's talking about when he mentions the covenant because he doesn't go into any detail. He just mentions it, the covenant, right? The, the, the service, the adoption, right? The covenants, they already know the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the Davidic covenant. They understand. They've been schooled on this. They've been trained in this. But the average Gentile has no idea what he's talking about. Just like some of us today may have no idea what I'm talking about even now, <laughs> right? Let's read on. Verses five through 13. Paul mentions the fathers, that's the Jews, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Christ's connection to them, how Christ is connected. And immediately in verse 6, he explains that the word of God has not failed in its effect, right? He uses the word for, and that's the explanation. He says, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? The the the, the covenants were given to Israel as a nation nationally, as a people. And you look at the attitude of the people that were arguing with Jesus. They said, we're, we're the descendants of Abraham. What does that mean? Oh, we, we have the covenants. We have the temple service. All the things Paul just mentioned here. We have, we have the adoption. We, we have the law and the service of God. And what does Jesus do? He, he bypasses all that. Why, why do you think that's so? Why is all Israel not Israel? What's the problem? Yeah, Brian just said it. 
Brian, I can't hear you. He said unbelief. Yes. The, unbelief. the problem is unbelief. Failure, failure, failure to believe. When they were in the desert, what was the problem? <laughs> yeah. They didn't believe. Even after seeing God deliver them in Egypt with all the miracles, right, the judgments, and then in the desert, or not the desert, at the Red Sea, part of the Red Sea. How in the world could you doubt God after seeing the Red Sea parted right before your eyes? The Shekinah and your glory was, coming down. And... The, the pillar of fire, the Shekinah glory coming down? How can you doubt God after you've seen such spectacular miracles as that? Right. And brother, can I just say one thing too? Did, didn't, please, didn't, please. didn't Jesus say, um, if you would be the children of Abraham, then do the works of Abraham? And yes. what were the works of Abraham? What was the work of Abraham? It was faith, right? Absolutely. That was his first work, if you will. You know, it was right. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Amen. He, thank you, Joey. He, he believed God. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to his account as righteousness. What God without faith, it's impossible to please Him. In any dispensation. You can't be saved without faith. You can't please God as a saved person without faith. Because you're saved by grace through faith. And now as saved people, how do we live our life? We live our lives by faith. That doesn't mean you don't get up and go to work in the morning. <laughs> waiting, waiting for man out of heaven to fall down, right? Ashley's in school. That doesn't mean you don't study, Ashley, and you expect to get straight A's. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. You don't work, you don't work, you don't eat, right? Right? You got to put your work in. That's expected. But you walk by faith and not by sight. Right? And, and practically on our end, what does that mean today? What does it mean? What does it mean to have faith today? I like to explain it to people for me for school is that because some people, I remember jokingly one time when um, I lived in Syracuse still and we were supposed to be going out to dinner as a family, and I had to study, and because uh, I've been in school my whole life, and I uh, brought my books to Denny's with us, and Jamal made a joke and was like, oh, you don't have to study. It's okay. God's got you, and I said, well, I still have to do my part. I still have to put the work in. Faith is not me saying, okay, I'm not going to do my part. God's just going to take care of it. It's saying that I know that what I do is enough, and there's a point where my work ends and his work begins, and I have to leave it to him at that point Amen. and know that uh, he is the author and finisher of my will and that I do my part, and then I leave the rest to him. So, like, Amen. that's a personal example for me. It's not that you just don't do the work. It's that you do the work, but then you understand that the final decision is not even up to you. Right. You've done all that you can do, and then you step back. And having done all that you can do, you step back and you get out of the way. And God is going to have mercy upon whom he's going to have mercy. And he's going to do what he needs to do for his own honor and glory. And the good news, all things work together for good. We just learned that in Romans 8, right? To those who love God, which you do, and who are called according to his purpose. So maybe there's a storm and you're on an island, Ashley, and you're going to school, and the, and the school is destroyed, right? And it looks bad in every direction. But many, 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 many good things come out of that, right? God puts you in a different place at a different time, and all of your needs are met step by step. And even, though, even though it looks terrible in the beginning, right? <laughs> you're, you're in that room, and the water's climbing, and you're I don't know what you're doing, you know. You're trying to get to the top of the ceiling to avoid the flood. I don't know. We are very concerned about you and praying for you. And I said, the window just broke. What do we do? And then the phone cut out. And then they didn't Yeah, talk yeah, on the phone with me when it happened. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Junie says, pray for Ashley. Oh, how we were nervous. We said, Lord, yeah. we know you got this. We're going to just put it in your hands and have faith. We've, we've done all we can do. And all we can ever really do much of the time is just pray. But you have to take responsibility, personal responsibility for yourself. You're in school, study. You're at work, do a good job. Amen? So yeah. that if somebody's going to criticize you or judge you, you've done what you're supposed to do on your end. We trust God for the rest. Amen. Amen. Uh, verses 5 through 13. 
So the connection between the fathers and Christ does require faith. But he explains the word of God has not failed in its effect because all of Israel is not Israel. And as we just said, part of Israel didn't have faith. And because they were the seed of Abraham does not qualify them on that basis. What qualifies them is the fact that they have faith in God. They trust God. They believe his word. Excuse me. Look at uh, verse 11 in our book. It's, we're getting towards the bottom, that last complete paragraph to the bottom, page 99. For the children being not yet born, referring to who? Jacob and Esau. Esau, yep. Neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So he's saying that Jacob and Esau hadn't done a thing. They weren't even born yet. And yet God says, Jacob I love and Esau I hated. This is what we call anthropopathic language. An anthropopathism, right? To say that God hates. The Bible says God is love. And they that are born of God love. They that love are born of God, right? So it's describing God, a policy. It's describing his policy. So this helps us to understand when he says, Jacob I love and Esau I hated. We know that Jacob, his name means heel catcher. <laughs> Here's these two, these two babies, right, born together, twins, uh, non-identical twins, born together. And Jacob, Esau and left the womb first. So Esau is born first, but Jacob reached out and grabbed his brother's ankle, <laughs> grabbed his foot. And uh, his name is called Jacob, heel catcher. And, it, and uh, it literally, I guess it really breaks down to more than that. He was a liar and a deceiver and a con. <laughs> Jake, Jacob was quite a con. So morally speaking, maybe Jacob wasn't as good as Esau, but Jacob had faith and believed God and trusted God, whereas Esau, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And we see this as a pattern, the good seed and the bad seed. Years ago, I remember watching this movie called um, The Bad Seed with this little girl named Rhoda. She, was, she, had, she had the devil in her. The movie's called The Bad Seed, and just showed how she was just a rotten kid. She would kill people. She would set buildings on fire. She was doing all kinds of things. And we see this pattern in the Bible of the good seed versus the bad seed. We see it right from the beginning with Cain and Abel. Cain was the bad seed. Abel was the good seed. The bad seed killed the good seed. So God had to raise up another seed, Seth. Now, Adam and Eve had many, many children, but that royal line comes to the line of Seth. That's the royal line. And, and as we trace Christ's lineage, we see that when we, when we go through. So you've got the good seed and you've got the bad seed. Uh, he goes on for the children. Let me go to verse Verse 11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works. That's the key, not of works, but of him that calleth. So God in his sovereign grace has made some decisions here. As far as that national entity, just like the body of Christ is a national entity, right? Clearly, election has to do with what God has decided before the birth of either of these two boys. And God knew that Jacob would be a believer. And he also knew that Esau would not believe. And this comes into view when we reach verses 30 through 32, where we see faith mentioned for the first time in chapter 9. So we see that word faith, and it ties it up all that has proceeded. So this whole chapter comes together, as it were, hinging on this one word, faith. God does not arbitrarily accept or reject Jacob or Esau. Very important that we understand that. If you don't understand that, you're going to end up being a Calvinist. You're going to end up being a Calvinist. Um, anyways, let's move on. So God doesn't arbitrarily accept or reject anybody. And we learn that without faith, it's impossible to please God. We are never acceptable without righteousness, and we never obtain absolute righteousness without faith. Without faith in God and the gospel that he presents to us, whatever, whatever dispensation we end up in. 
if if it were the other way around, the way the Calvinists try to present it, God would be the author of sin because he would make Esau be an unbeliever. Of course. Or he wouldn't do enough to, to get him across the finish line. And it says across, God gives God gives the the necessary faith to every man. The Bible says to every man, every human being, male and female, mm -hmm. is dealt the measure of faith. Yeah. So everyone is equipped with the basics. You have everything you need to believe in Christ. You 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 should be able to respond once you get the gospel. But if you go on negative signals and you decide you're not going to believe, you hate the idea. And Jesus explains why people feel that way. He says, men love darkness, darkness, darkness more than light because their deeds, are, their deeds are evil. They love darkness. If they love darkness, they're not coming to the light. You know, you're, when you're in your sins and you're hating God, you're very nocturnal. Mm -hmm. Well, think about it. You're very nocturnal. You don't want the light sun because it shines on your life and on your failure and on the darkness that's in you. So you're either going to come to the light and get out of the darkness or you're going to stay in the dark. And that's exactly what people do. Think about somebody that you've witnessed to for years who hasn't responded. They love the darkness. They love where they're at. They, they, may, not, they may not acknowledge that they're in darkness. They may actually think they're in the light. But they're not going to. They're not going to. They're not going to respond to the truth, and everything that they need to respond, they've got it. The problem is when you go negative, and Satan steps in there also to help you out, and your mind can be blinded. A lot of people think, "Oh, I can't be blinded. I can't be blinded." Oh, yes, you can be blinded. And even as a Christian, you might be blinded to certain truths, and we know that because we talk to people about right division all the time, and they don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. right so who's blinding your mind so that you can't rightly divide the word that you hate the very idea of rightly dividing the word that you're offended by the very mention of the apostle paul being our apostle the apostle to the gentiles to the members of the body of christ why would that why would that get you upset even hearing that right certain christians are triggered when you mention paul's gospel they say there's only one gospel and they're mad at you like you're a heretic. And they're going to jump on Facebook and talk about you. <laughs> uh, I, 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 just, I just say, when I, when I read R. Dawson Barlow's uh, book, The Two Gospels, I, I was jumping for joy because I kind of, for, for the first time in my life, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm finally set free from Matthew 7, which is like, crushed <laughs> me every time I read it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah when, when I got saved, Joe, here I am, a baby Christian. I mean, I really didn't understand very much, but, and, and you know, one thing was weird is somehow the enemy was keeping me away from the book of Romans. I was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John quite a bit, but as I'm reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but I didn't get saved reading those books. I got saved because God got to me, got the gospel to me. Amen. Yeah. And I, I somehow stumbled into salvation, heard, hearing the gospel, believed, was saved. He saved me so fast, I didn't have time to, to mess it up on my own. And as I'm reading the Gospels, I'm like, okay, that's not how I got saved, but I know I'm saved. <laughs> that's the best I could do, Junie. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm rightly dividing unconsciously. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, you know, well, do I need to be baptized? People are telling me I better get baptized. I said, I'm going to get baptized, but I'm already saved. I'm already saved. I know I'm saved. Am I supposed to be baptized? Is that being obedient to the Lord? Okay. I'll be obedient. I'll go get baptized. That's something he wants me to do, which I didn't understand that the Holy Spirit had already baptized me. I didn't understand that. Yeah. I always understood that it was a finished work on the cross. Yeah, that we had. I knew that I'm a saved person. My sins are covered. I believe that's all I can do. And God responded and he let me know you're saved. I'm a saved man. Amen. But, 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 I didn't know how to rightly divide or all the rest of that. Well, let's finish up. Let's get uh, quickly here. He, ta he talks about the, uh, at, we're at the top of page 100. Many like to argue election from the context of faith in Christ. They present election as if it were part, apart from faith. 
And that is simply not the case. We talked about election last week, so I'm not going to spend too much time here today. But election is in Christ. There's no election outside of Christ. And Paul said there were people that were in Christ before him. Not in Christ as the body of Christ, no. But every saved person is in Christ. Every saved person is in Christ. Every saved person down through the ages is not a member of the body of Christ. That began with the Apostle Paul. But every saved person is in Christ. Even as every unsaved person is in Adam. Uh, let's jump down to verse 24. Almost in the middle of the page, God has always called Gentiles and not Jews only. And he says he is also the God of the Gentiles. And that Paul asked that question. Is he not the God of the Gentiles? Is he of the Jews only? No. He's also the God of the Gentiles as well. Which is to say, he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And he didn't create only the Jews. He created Gentiles as well. And being no respecter of persons, he's God to all and fair to all. Uh, verse 25, Paul quotes Hosea, the prophet Hosea in the Old Testament, uh, and the prophet who God taught much about his own relationship with unfaithful Israel. This is a very painful section of the scripture to even consider the book of Hosea. I don't know what you know about Hosea, but we mentioned a little bit of information here. Hosea had three children. The second and third, he was certain, were not his children. <laughs> So I make that joke about Maury Povich because you watch the Maury Povich show and, and some guys jumping up and down, I'm not the father, I'm not the father and all this nonsense and uh, ridiculousness. But uh, Hosea might have been one of those men on that show <laughs> if they had it back then because he had three children and uh, he was certain that the last two were not his. And he expressed this in the names that he gave his children. Wow, can you imagine such a thing? You, you, you're married, your wife's unfaithful, she gets pregnant and she has a baby. And then the same thing happens again. So you have two children and you, you're, you're pretty certain that those two kids are not yours. And of course, right when the kids are born, you gotta come up with a name for the child. And the first, and, and he gives these kids names. Uh, one child he named Lo Ruhama. Now I have a house, a family, my wife and I have, a, I have a, rental, a rental property on Ruhama Ave in Nedro. So I kind of laughed when I saw the name of the street Ruhama. And uh, Lo Ruhama means one for whom no affection is felt. What a terrible name to call your child, Lo Ruhama. And then the, the meaning means, I don't have any feelings of affection towards you. I don't feel connected to you. I don't think I'm your dad. Oh, no. Oh, the poor child. Who wants to grow up under that kind of a burden, right? Well, there's another child. And then there's another one called Lo Ami, which means no kin of mine. Oh, that's what the word lo ami means, no kin of mine. And we see it translated uh, in the New Testament where, 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 where God is saying to Israel, you're not my people, you're not, you're not related to me anymore. And how could God say to them that they're not related anymore? Because there's a divorce. A lot of people don't like to talk about the fact that God is divorced. <laughs> God is divorced, not two and three times like some of us. <laughs> He's divorced. And he's divorced because Israel was unfaithful. And Isaiah felt God's pain and God's sorrow because he had two children which were not his own. But he's quite a man because here he is raising these children anyways. Praise God. It's not the child's fault for sure. Uh, verses 9 through, uh, excuse me, 27 through 29. Chapter 9, verses 27 through 29. Hosea and Isaiah are quoted to demonstrate, here's the reason, to demonstrate the calling of Gentiles was foretold. So some would like to say, well, God only loves the Jews. He only deals with the Jews. No. He always had a plan for Gentiles. Gentiles were always included and always invited to have faith. 
along with the failure of Israel to believe the prophets, the law, and finally the gospel of God, Paul speaks of in chapter 1. Paul, in quoting Isaiah, draws our attention to his prophecy to Israel of the impending invasion of the Assyrian army. Isaiah's oldest son, that's a long name, Sher Jesub, meaning a remnant will return, promising that they're going to return, even though they're carried off into captivity, was a sign to Judah. Israel failed the required righteousness because they stumbled at the stumbling stone. They rejected Christ. The cross, the cross of Christ, the crucifixion, was an offense. And they didn't recognize their sacrifice for sin, or Christ's sacrifice for sin at Golgotha, not Calvary. It's Golgotha, the hill of the skull, and not bound on the altar. Now I'm going to stop here for just a quick minute because we, we mentioned the offense. And I want to bring this thing home so, we, so that we understand the crucifixion itself was an offense. And part of the reason why they rejected Jesus, they rejected him before that, they didn't have faith before that, but he died the death of a criminal. I think we don't remember that or we don't think about that. You know, we wear jewelry. We have a cross around the neck and people have a cross ring and all. You know, we, we make the cross jewelry. But, but the, to die on a tree is to be cursed. Christ, who knew no sin, became sin, became cursed on our behalf, right? Instead of cursing us, God put that curse on himself, on his own son. And the crucifixion is a very graphic picture of being cursed. To die on a crucifixion, to die that horrible death. Not only is it a horrible death, it's a shameful death. They, they rip your clothes off, they beat you, you're naked. They, they nail your hands and your feet to the cross and you're publicly humiliated and disgraced. So a lot of people refuse to believe that God would curse his own son by putting him on a cross. That's what the, that's what the Muslims say. Islam, the Muslims reject it. No, no, this is an offensive thought. It's a horrific thought that God would love us so much, that God would care about us so much that he would go to such great lengths to lay down his own life. And not only just lay down his life, he, he didn't have his throat cut at the altar, right? They didn't bring him to the altar and tie him down like the animal said. No, he died a shameful death. He died, he died the death of a criminal, a horrible criminal. That's the death that they put him through. But all of our sins, he bore those sins on that cross, on that tree. And that's the offense. The offense is the cross itself and the death that he died. And for Israel to look at that and to say, that is the Messiah, that sounds like an absurd premise to them. Not only to Islam, but also to the Jew. It sounds like an absurdity. How in the world could he die such a hellacious, horrific death? dying in that fashion, being cursed by even God. That's, that has become a stumbling block and a rock of offense, the cross itself, the preaching of the cross. And even now when we preach the cross to people and tell them, you got to come to Jesus, there is no other way to come. You must come through him. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And if they're religious, like Islam or Jewish or many other beliefs as well, Talking about dying a shameful death like a criminal on a cross and bearing our sins. The Bible says to them that are perishing, that is foolishness. It sounds like foolishness to them, to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, whoo, it's the power of God. <laughs> right? Power of God, Amen. Power of God to us who believe, but to those who refuse to believe, it sounds like foolishness. And you can almost hear that when you're witnessing and sharing with people. They're, they're brushing you off like you sound like a nut, right? You sound crazy. You sound insane. God dying on a cross. God allowing himself to be executed like a criminal. They think you're out of your mind, right? That's what they think. 
but it's the power of God unto salvation. And if someone were here to hear that message and to believe, the second they believe that message, they're eternally saved. What a great God. What an amazing, incredible plan of salvation. Amen. Right? Well, let's finish up. Paul opens with a question. What shall we say then? We've seen this repeated over and over and over again all throughout Romans. He loves that expression. What shall we say then? Right? Well, what shall we say then? What conclusion are we to draw from what we've read? That's what he's saying. What shall we say then? Let's sum all this up. What, what do you think? What's going on here? The righteousness attained by faith was received by the Gentiles who weren't even looking for it, weren't even seeking it, but rejected by Jews who followed after the law of righteousness, but never attained it. And how could they? Their, the, the failure is that they didn't seek it by faith. Faith is the key. This chapter closes with a quotation from Isaiah and those of us who believe will never be ashamed. Christ is no stumbling stone to us, but he is our rock and our stability and our security. If you think your security is your job, you don't have any security. Yeah, if you think your security is your bank account, you don't have any security. If you think your security is your health, you're healthy or you're young or you're old like me or whatever you're, whatever you're counting on and that's your security, well, you're in trouble, right? You're in a state of delusion. Christ is our security. And as soon as we recognize that Christ is our security, we have peace. If you don't recognize Christ as your security, you're not going to have peace. You're going to be unstable. Christ is not only our rock, and he's called our rock because the rock is stable. You have great stability if you're standing on the rock. Not only do you have stability, you have security, and he is said to be our strong tower. We're done in just a minute. Our salvation, our hope, these are all in all. So we're going to tackle these questions next week. It's 8.42, so we're almost, almost 15 minutes over time. But we'll begin with our questions next week. Okay? Amen. So we've covered it. we got the tape to go over it, to review it. Let's come prepared to answer those 20 questions next time. Amen? Amen. Any, any comments? Any questions? Thank you yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I just say thank yeah. you for changing the time, guys. I appreciate it. Amen. Thank you, Ashley. I, I was just going to say, too, <coughs> did, did anybody see uh, – oh, that was a great, great teaching. Thank you so much, brother. That was excellent. Um, mm -hmm. A lot to chew on, too. Um, uh, but also, did, did anybody see – the gospel preached visually, if you will, although the gospel is words, let's never forget that. But it was, it was almost like a play out of the gospel where, where Trump uh, issued a pardon to John Ponder. I'm very and, and, like that. Oh, I just, all I could think of is Jesus and how he issued the pardon, you know, to me when I trusted in his finished work. And, I didn't catch yeah. it. Who was, who was John Ponder? Uh, so John, John Ponder uh, knocked over a bank, and then the FBI agent that put him there, they always stayed in touch. John Ponder, hopefully, I, I'd like to believe that he's a saved man. I think he is. Mm -hmm. uh, and he found Christ in, 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 in the jail. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, uh, and then he got out, and he, and, uh, he started a, a, a program, and, you know, um, that, you know, was for other people that would you know, like uh, find work after they get out of, out of jail. It was, it's a really beautiful program. And um, Donald Trump, uh, you know, they, they talked about all that. And at the end of it, uh, President Trump said, oh, and I have a surprise for you. It's a full pardon. And he just broke down crying. Everybody mm. broke down crying. It was, it was really moving. Yeah. And it just made me think that's, that's exactly what, in a way, that's what, that's what God did for me when, I, and you and all of us, when we put our faith in, in Jesus Christ, we were given a full pardon for all sin, past, present, and future, uh, the moment we trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen, Amen. Joe. And, Amen. And Amen. the resurrection as well, of course. And uh, hallelujah. So, so I just want to say thank, thanks all for letting me join this call as well.
Amen. Amen. Well, we're thrilled to have you, Joe. We're, we're glad you're a part of the group. I'm glad to be here. Amen. Very happy to have you here, brother. All right. Amen. Any more, any more comments or questions? Okay. If not, could we have uh, Ashley, could you close us up tonight? Sure. I hope everybody bow their heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, humbly come to you and we just thank you so much for the time that we're allowed to come together and be in fellowship with one another. We thank you so much for the word that was brought to us and we just hope that it speaks to someone here and resonates within our hearts. Lord, we just thank you for all the work that you did and we thank you so much and we give you all the glory. We ask that you keep us safe throughout the week, Lord, and just continue to um, uplift all of us and we keep everyone on our prayer list and our thoughts and our prayers, Lord, and even the ones that are the silent prayers, you know what they need. And we ask that you just bring us back together safely on Sunday. We ask all these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Sunday, 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 by the way, Osiris is set to preach. He's to, he's, okay, that's the last Sunday, okay. Sunday is the last Sunday.